I'm going to present to you guys uh, a concept called Beaver Dam Analog Systems. And before I present them, I'm going to tell you this is kind of an ache and it pains me in some ways to present this because I have definitely not appreciated the opinion of the researchers related to Beaver Dam Analog Systems and kind of I've had strong opinions one way or another. Um, so I'm going to present these and uh, it's kind of a work in progress for me. So I, I can see the value merit of it. I still find myself a little kind of um, uneasy about this system, uh, but I do want to present it because it's quite the buzz right now. A lot of people are talking about these systems and uh, um, I want to at least let people see where they where they are right now. So. A beaver dam analog system is basically a system where we're trying to produce something that will act as a beaver dam. Uh, they're usually a low cost thing that can be installed by hand labor. Uh, so here on this detail, you can see a number of poles or posts that are placed. They have a significant space in on these poles um, and they're shaped in a kind of a inverse weir uh, direction. So basically, it points as an arrow slightly downstream um, and it's created with a some hard poles and then we weaved willows cobbles and mattress material vegetation material that's weaved inside of there to create a dam so the idea is that if you have an incised system um, you can create a connected wet meadow um, and through a series of beaver dams. So essentially it's the same idea, it's the same idea as a uh, priority one restoration, except there is no consideration to what the channel uh, dimension needs to be. It's literally just changing the bed profile uh, and there's no consideration to what the plan form needs to be other than the fact that when you raise up the water high enough, there'll be new flow paths that are found and that will change the uh that will change the uh that will change the uh uh plan form as well uh i just got a note am i not sharing my screen i can see it dave you can see it brad yep i, I can see, see the beaver dam analog figure i can see it too all I've got is what is a calling, and it hasn't changed since I logged on. Might be my computer. Sorry. Yeah, I think, Gina, your your computer's stuck or something. I think we've been seeing it all along. Story Try of my life. Thanks, Brad. By the way, you look like <laughs> Kilroy. <laughs> Everybody says that. I don't know why. You want me? I... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say everybody of a certain age says that. How about that? <laughs> yeah, lots of youngsters don't even know who Kilroy is, so, you know. <laughs> Thanks for sharing though, Gina. All right, so um, so there's a restoration guidebook. I sent this out to everybody as a part of the link of the meeting invite this week. Uh, and I can't go over the entire restoration guidebook, so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what a beaver dam analog system is, open it up for questions, and then I'm going to give you some uh, ideas of how we evaluate this in some different settings. Uh, so you guys have a link to the beaver dam analog system if there's an interest let it be known and we can go into aspects or details of this more uh, but so a beaver dam analog system we had a project in a uh, denver they're building a new development on a creek called sterling in a place called sterling ranch on sterling gulch and uh our client wanted us to anal look at the idea of building beaver dam analog systems to reconnect floodplains in here so the peak flows of this uh were around uh, you know, 500 to 1,000 CFS. Uh, it's a fairly small drainage, but it still gets pretty good large flows associated with it. And we're at a pretty steep slope. This is about 3% slope on there. And it's a gul gulch, which means it's a channel that has eroded down, you know, hundreds of, or thousands of years ago and has stabilized to the flows that have been received by the larger storms and then in time it creates a stable floodplain at a lot lower elevation uh, through these soils. So this is kind of what it looks like. You have a little pilot channel that's hardly noticeable 
And then you have a big vegetative floodplain that's significantly cut down from where the landscape um, <clears throat> was after um, uh, more <clears throat> erosional processes of fan formations um, uh, after erosion of some of the mountains and the foothills had occurred. So what happens with these gulches is if you look at the shear stresses, you realize that the shear stress does not change that much uh, with an increase of flood flows to a certain stage. So essentially what's happened is that you have the 100 year discharge, the 50 year discharge, the 25 year discharge, the 500 year discharge, it all comes through here frequent enough that it carves out a valley uh, at this lower elevation and vegetation has been able to establish over a long period of time. So what they're looking to do is build a development here right on the sides of this gulch. Um, and there'll be homes on the development, there'll be infrastructure in that development. So what we were asked to do is look at the idea of just putting a beaver dam analog systems into this gulch to raise up the water. So we started looking at this and we used the manual that I sent to you as, uh, for a reference for the beaver dam analog structures. And we were looking at max slopes between structures about 0.6%. So we had to put in enough beaver dam analog drops to be able to have a very low slope between these structures. So we were talking about, you know, 23 drops uh, and beaver will combine 13 drops. We were gonna have 13 drops over this period of time. Um, with that said, every time that we raise up the, the stage and we don't address dimension, we're gonna change sediment transport capacity. So if we do have sediment supplies, they will deposit out at different rates uh, based on the slope and the depth that's going through each one of these systems. So one of the things that we do when we do a standard priority one restoration is we try to keep the slope and the depth pretty consistent so we can just convey sediment through the system. What this means is that you'll have unequal distribution of sediments on a site, which is probably gonna be fine in nature. The issue is if you're near infrastructure, it can be a little bit more difficult. So we're trying to figure out uh, the cost of these structures and they're hand built structures. So for on this one, the labor of building them across the width of the channel was still gonna be fairly expensive for us. So it was a, a cost that we looked at and how many poles we'd have to place. Um, and then the biggest thing that we got to is we used, uh, this comes in the manual that I sent you. This is kind of a, is it good? Is this a good location for beaver dams or is it not a good location for beaver dam analog systems? Um, and you go through each one of these ideas and say, okay, well, what's the stream slope? Well, if it's less than point one, then if it's less than 1%, it's gonna be a better idea for beaver dam analogs. If you're a lot steeper than 3%, then it's gonna be a little bit more difficult for beaver dam analog system because there's gonna be more head to blow out these beaver dam analog systems. If you're a confined valley, uh, confined channel, it's gonna be a lot better than if you're a wide, uh, so if you're a wide floodplain for the valley formation, it's gonna be a lot better than if you're a confined channel. So the idea being that if you get up to, you do beaver dam analog systems, it floods up the floodplain and the flood just goes on forever. And you don't build up much head, then it's pretty good. Uh, but this happened to be a confined system or a confined gulch. If, if the channel incision um, never gets out of bank, then it's not going to be as good for beaver dam analog systems as if it gets out of bank very frequently. And the idea being if it gets, doesn't get out of bank, then you're gonna have increased uh, shear stress with stage. Um, if, the, if you're urbanized and you have a narrow repairing mm -hmm. corridor, it's gonna be worse than if you have a very continuous wide repairing corridor. And then if you have a uh, beaver presence, that's gonna be a lot better than if you have no evidence of past beaver occupation. So we looked at this um, for this project and it made it really easy for us to tell our client who really wanted to do beaver ant damn analog systems that the manual tells us that we shouldn't be doing that in this location. Um, and I think that's important. I do have, you know, we're gonna be trying some beaver dam analog systems and we've tried some that were close to beaver dam analog systems, but we'll be trying them on some future projects, but they're gonna be all in kind of low risk areas. Uh, and the idea is how do we incorporate these and how do we look at risk associated with these systems? Um, I think most of the science is saying that, hey, beavers play a critical role in the ecology of riparian areas. The idea is how do we manage uh, 
uh, the role that they play with the goals and objectives of projects as they come up. So on this project, uh, we looked at a potential for a head cut that would occur and we were very concerned about the idea of flanking of beaver dam structures and then creating an opportunity for a concentrated flow path and a head cut up against a hill slope for confinement. So it ended up being something where we decided not to look at a beaver dam analog systems on this reach just because of the nature of the goals and objectives being an urbanized setting. So, you know, to me, I still have questions with beaver dam analog systems. I don't completely understand this. I'm not at the point that I kind of get angry every time that I hear somebody present on them again, uh, like I was a couple of years ago. Um, but I do believe that they're probably a tool that we can use and we can start adding a little bit more engineered ideas to them to help us get to a risk level that's appropriate and to meet goals and objectives. Uh, so one of the things that we ha nobody's really looked at much yet is the scour depth related to these beaver dam analog systems. And that's something I think we can probably uh, help in the future with people designing to is look at, okay, well, what's the scour depth? What does it look like if we, if we put down woody debris for the scour depth for protection, will that be enough? Or do we need to uh, have a certain space and of drop heights in between these beaver dam analog systems. Um, you know, flood frequency of these is going to make a big difference. And then just the applied shear stress and what range of applied shear stresses these beaver dams can take. We could get a lot of information uh, from natural settings looking at rack lines and if beaver dams are there from year to year on aerial photography. We could come up with ideas of how much drop you can take over these and how much shear stress you can take over a beaver dam. Uh, so um, there's been a lot of research going into beaver dams. Most of beaver dam research has been more from a scientific standpoint, less from an engineering standpoint. So I think there's a lot to add uh, from an engineering group if we're gonna be trying to use these as a tool for future restoration projects. They do have a potential uh, when the valleys are narrow enough of being a very low cost option. Uh, we do have, we're, be, we're being pushed on a lot of places to do these. We have been pushed on rivers that are 70 foot wide, 80 foot wide, use beaver dam analog structures uh, but there's no evidence of beaver dam analog structures working on that big of rivers and we have no background of information. So I think part of it is using the reference that I shared with you today as saying, hey, this is where they're recommending it to. Let's not go outside of this range for the time being until we find out if we can do better. Uh, there is a free training course, which is pretty cool. So the price is right. Uh, and it's part of four days. It's August 11th through 14th. Uh, so it's coming up in two weeks and it's being taught by Utah State University um, and it's low tech process based restoration for riverscapes. Uh, so if you Google it, they uh, like to use the PAPS Blue Ribbon Beer logo for it. So you'll see that all over it. They're not giving free PAPS Blue Ribbon Beer via virtual meetings, but um, uh, it's kind of their logo. So process, uh, uh, process based restoration, PBR. So uh, um, so that's kind of a little bit of ideas. Does anybody have any, any questions, thoughts, concerns that you want to add about Beaver Dam Analog System this morning? Dave, it's Brad. I mean, I, I've been really intrigued by it. I mean, I brought Scott McGill from Ecotone up to speak in, in Toronto last year. Um, I, I think the thing that kind of weirds me out the most is that, you know, we're all familiar with the fact that beaver dams fail on a pretty regular basis. Now, beavers are really good at rebuilding them, and that's not a big deal, but I, I'm just a little concerned about the failure frequency of, of structures like this. Uh, has anybody been looking at sort of what the expected duration of, of how long they last before they start to give way? Because I, I would assume... You know what, Brad? Sorry? I, I've been looking... This is Josh. I've been looking at that, and I don't think um, the frequency and the, and the magnitude, you know, the intensity and magnitude of that failure should be... Um, mitigated by by the receiving valley so given how big the beaver pond might be you should have a stream length in a valley that's that's able to offset those losses if you've seen a beaver dam fail they don't i've watched beaver dam failures and they they don't fail the same as like a big concrete dam would yeah but they 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 certainly do you know and cumulatively um you know typically when you have them in series 
you get a little bit of a, a buffer effect, uh, you know, further downstream by those dams um, if, if you have a failure from the upstream down. And, and same with downstream up, you still have a series. It's a big consideration. And, and, and here's the crux of, of the beaver dam thing for me is we've studied uh, sediment-driven, sediment-dominated systems a lot, and we get that. But the beaver introduce a, a physical process that's more, uh, it's a biological driven physical process. They create hydroperiod, and hydroperiod, you know, stimulates the biological component of these natural systems. And then we end up with a natural system where the predictability is not a function of physics, it's a function of biology. So like Dave said, you know, the, the basic science that needs to go into it is, is it's still uh, vast. And, and I think, uh, and applying it as engineers and, and stewards, it's important not to not to pull a Lego out of this kit and mix it with that kit because it looks like a cool piece, uh, w which sometimes does generate some good creativity. But but being cautious and, and like David's uh, approach uh, where the recommendation, I think what I saw was it's probably not a good idea. You know, being mindful like that is going to be the key we've seen with our past, in our past, with, with stream restoration. And site selection is hugely important. Um, there's good papers that show this – you know, a lot of our, you know, the, the, the stream valley evolution model that we that we adhere to, that we all subscribe to by Stanley Shum, uh, there's a really good paper, and Dave probably referenced it. I thought it was written in 2017. might be the one he already showed. But, you know, the, the, the role that beavers have as a geomorphic agent is really important. So all that to answer your question, Brad, is, yeah, there has to be the right scenario to reintroduce or to apply these techniques. You got to be ready for the beavers, be ready for their failures, and have the ecosystem that can handle that. Thanks, Josh. Dave, are they getting much traction? Like I, I you know, I. It was interesting. I saw that I think the person that was on with the references was Janine Castro, and I've heard her speak at a couple of conferences, and she's pretty good. So, I mean, obviously they put out this manual. So, is it gaining some some traction? I, I, when Scott McGill was up in Toronto, I asked them whether they'd had any success in getting, you know, sort of the the, the agencies to to accept restoration using beavers, and his comment was, and of course he's trying to reintroduce beavers as opposed to create analogs, but. His, his comment was they weren't getting much success with their agencies to, to buy into the idea. Yeah, yeah so um, in the last month, we've seen three uh, pro, three RFPs come out related to Beaver Dam analog systems. Wow. Um, fund, funded from different agencies, which is which is more, more than I've ever seen in a month prior to that, but I'm not, you know, it could just be I wasn't looking. Um, and then uh, we've had trying to think uh, we currently have a couple projects where clients are asking for beaver dam and analog systems uh, so we're sometimes they don't even know what they're asking for they just heard the phrase um, so we try to communicate with them and you know on the one project it's on a large river the Mojave River um, out in California and that one's not really appropriate for beaver dam analog systems based on literature but they still want to encourage uh, beavers. So you just, you, you kind of encourage them towards priority one restoration and uh, side chain on habitat for beavers in that case. Uh, but, um, but it definitely seems to be gaining traction. So. Interesting. I think there's a, there's a romantic notion of having small furry critters coming in and they don't understand the ecology. They don't understand, you know, that a big river beaver's not even going to tackle that himself so um yeah it's education on both sides i think we, we could breed, breed them with poodles and then people can make them pets oh get that get that nice thick coat with really curls tight yeah. curls on it that'd be adorable we can even get doodles. trimmed <laughs> the poodles. yeah pet poodles beaver doodles from the actual mm. i mean as a biologist as a biologist, I love the idea of, of beaver systems and that sort of thing and, and reintroducing beavers in the appropriate situation. And even the, the idea of putting these beaver dam analogs in, in the appropriate situation, but you're gonna get a lot of clients that just jump on, ooh, it's a beaver. 
So. Yeah. So Dave, the RFPs, are they by agencies or are they by private developers or both? So it's coming from both the, the regulator side, and the developer side? Yeah, one of them's related to a water developer in Colorado and they're trying to develop water and get mitigation for it. Uh, okay. And so that's kind of one of the things that they're looking to do. So I don't know how they sold it to the regulators and they agreed to it or how, how that exactly worked out. So are looking for more opportunities to do that. The other one, uh, was related to NIFWIF, uh, so uh, National Fish and Wildlife. Uh, national, I forget the abbreviation of it, but uh, basically uh, federal agency for grant stuff. So. Okay, cool. Thanks. We uh, we we had a uh, mit our mitigation uh, um, strategy on a project in South Carolina recently. It's been just constructed. The whole mitigation uh, approach was to restore the natural hydrology. In, in the valley bottom, and that included um, that included just uh, accommodating the presence of beavers. So the presence of beavers are giving us linear because it's part of a linear system. These beavers don't live on lakes; they live in streams, uh, and they interrupt the streams uh, and some of the stream hydraulics with their own effects. And so we that was our case uh, was restoring hydrology is going to. And the agencies asked, "Well, what about when the beavers show up?" And we said, "Well, then they." They probably like to fish and have families. What what else? Um, there there weren't any threats or risks, and we were very mindful of that. Uh, the, the downstream roads and the adjacent property owners. There, there really was no perceivable risk. It was a great site to to accommodate beavers. But yeah, it's actually as part of our mitigation, offsetting some losses to a. In fact, the losses were a, a relic beaver pond that had turned into a a single threaded channel. Uh, through maintenance, um, we, we said, well, this is perfect offset. It's the same thing at the beaver pond for beaver pond. So it, it um, yeah, it, it, was, it was a matter of just having a, a forward thinking IRG and a DOT was a big did you, did you keep a couple of good looking poodles down there to lure the beavers in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get some beaver, some beaver doodles and, uh, you know, take them for a haircut and put some bows in their hairs and, Take them to the soccer game, you know. <laughs> it's it's a it's a big shift though. I mean, uh, so I started in this field in the uh, late '90s, early 2000s, and in '99, uh, beavers were considered one of the worst problems for stream restoration projects. Well into 20, 2003, 2004. Yeah. Yeah, that came from the same institution that promoted trapezoidal ditches, too. What well, was that common bread? <laughs> no, that, that was Josh. He said, you know, that's coming from, the, you know, the, the institution uh, that, you know, our, our, our heritage and stream restoration, uh, all of the yeah. agencies and, and a lot of our other proud heritage. Yeah, they, they, they also were the same ones that thought straight trapezoidal channels were a good idea. So they aren't, Josh? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> Beavers are, it depends, yeah. Because, I mean, we, we can't commoditize it. It's not a commodity. You, you just can't package it and sell it. Yeah, you have to have the right application, huh? Dave, uh, I think we're getting close to wrapping up. Are you going to send an invite for a Zoom call this morning to talk about Alabama? Uh, yeah, I think I already did. Did you? Oh, okay. I didn't see it, so I'll, I'll have a look for it. Thank you. Yeah. It was, it was, I think it was early this morning. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. All right. Well, hey, I, uh, I'll stay on the line for whoever wants to be on the line if you have questions about Beaver Dam analogs or if you have questions kind of related to comfort type of stuff, always feel free to call or email the group or call or email me directly. Uh, and I appreciate your time, guys. Have a great week. Thank you. Hey, Matt, Tanner's humor was not very funny. You didn't like that, Dave? <laughs> I, I was reading in the car 
to me as I was as as uh, oh. you know as I came in. So uh, we were we were really kind of confused by it, but not, I mean it was kind of funny. But man, what a jerk! <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny. We were sitting there. I mean, it was like four o'clock, and uh, you know, Tanner and I had called each other three or four times that afternoon. Yeah. You know, checking to see, have you seen this thing yet? Has it come out? Did you get the email? No, I think you're supposed to get the email, you know. <laughs> finally, the last time we were on the call together, and I was I was literally driving back from, from Bodar. And so he's on the call. He called me, and so I pulled off on the shoulder of the road, and we're talking. Yeah. And, and then, boop, no. it, up it popped, you know, um, on my, <laughs> on my in, in, inbox. And I'm like, okay, calm down, calm down. We got it. It, it's here, and I, I skimmed through the letter. And I'm like, yeah, we're on we're on the right list. There are two lists. There are t the list of people who were not shortlisted, and then there's a list of people who are shortlisted, and we're on the right one. So he he took so a, he is, took, a is, uh, took a breather. Is Texas is Texas Mitigation Solutions? Is that MSUSA? Is or is that something different? Thank you. It's EIP, Dave. It's EIP. Oh, okay. okay yeah, gotcha. Texas Mitigation Solutions. They pulled the plans when the when this thing came out. Uh, we saw them pop up on the list and kind of scratched our heads and wondered who they were. We did some research. Uh, Tanner did some research on corporate wiki and up it popped. It, it's it's all just a it's just a LLC of EIP. We don't know who else are, uh, is on that team in particular. Um, yeah, we do know on Westervelt's team they've got Adam Rigsby. That's who I've been told. Uh, Adam Rigsby's okay. on that team, and there's a there's a there's another company. I was going to check and see if you knew who these people were. You may know them. Uh, let me check my list here. Um, this is kind of ironic, giving your topic from this morning. But another another component of the EIP team is Beaver Creek Hydrology. Oh yeah, I know. I know them. They're out of Kentucky. Nope. Yes, they're out of Kentucky. That is the Beaver Creek Hydrology. Just yeah, out of curiosity, the guy that's in, what do you know about the them? Guy that started, about. Yeah, the guy that started them was um, the guy that actually was the author of River Morph. So he used to work for FNSM before FNSM was bought by Stantec. So. Wow. Cool. Okay. That sounds like yeah, a heavy. No, he's, yeah. Yeah. He's pretty good. His 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 biggest sin was. Uh, uh, where he hit heads with FMSM is that uh, he wanted to do a lot more kind of theoretical thinking about rivers and they just need to make money and kind of make a business out of it and stuff. So that was kind of the, the, the thing there. So, yeah. So. Well, good what, was man. The, what was his name, David? I have to think about it. That's, that's a, uh, that's a door that's not open to me right now. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. I'll probably think of it in an hour or two. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just curious. Not a big deal. Yeah, I, I had I only worked with him. Oh, he came to a training mind, course at the University of Kentucky. Um, he came to one of our training courses at the University of Kentucky back in 2000. And, uh, Case Davis. So what's that? Case Davis. No, no, no. Uh, a North Kentucky guy. State guy. That's what I got. Oh, cool. And he was at Tetra Tech before, is what is what what my intel is is providing me. So we know who we're competing against now, and it's not really a surprise. These are folks we've competed against several times. I was surprised to see North American Coal's mitigation subsidiary was not on the list. Yeah. So. Where's where's ecosystem investment partner, partners out of? Baltimore. Baltimore, okay. okay. Yeah, and that's where the LLC is registered. So we traced it back to Baltimore, and then through a corporate wiki, we could see that it was built built up by subsidiaries of EIP. Gotcha. gotcha. Well, very good. Well, hey guys, we will uh, see. You have a great week. You too, David. Be talking to you soon. Take care.
Bye, Gina. Bye. Bye, Dave. Gina Wolf.